So welcome everybody. It is so nice to see so many familiar names and face here. My name is Ken Wu and welcome to the second session of Bridge the Gap virtual event series. We hope you and your family, friends and loved ones all well and safe and you remain that way. We are sorry that we aren't able to host you here at Saunders College of Business as planned. We had a couple of very nice plan, of course. We have planned to have nice receptions and fabulous dinner. It would be fun to socialize and be together. Unfortunately, the time has dictated the otherwise. So I apologize for that. I hope next time when the time turn around, we will be able to do that or something similar in our newly expanded building. Before we start, I just want to make one note. I want to thank you for everyone for attending this session. I know how much you have to do to balance your online learning, family, work, and other commitments. I also appreciate support from Saunders Accounting Advisory Board, Office of Alumni Relations, Office of Advancement, Office of Career Services, and Office of Communication. With that, now I turn to, to former Chair of Accounting and Finance and the current Chair of International Hospitality and the Service Innovation Bill, Jesnak. Welcome everyone, and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Ken. Great to see everybody. Um, as Ken mentioned, I am currently interim chair of the Department of Hospitality and Service Innovation at RIT, Saunders College of Business, um, but I am accounting faculty and former chair of the Accounting and Finance uh, Department, and I am honored to be here with several of our really distinguished alumni, great people um, who are going to share some of uh, their uh, experience and some of the things that uh, they did to get to the level they've gotten to. I do also want to thank our advisory board. I know a couple members of the committee that put this together, Ken Wu, our faculty member who's uh, coordinating this, um, but also Bob Patrone, uh, Carolyn Reitz, and Michelle Pritchard. And I'll introduce the fourth member now. So I'm going to introduce our three guests. Um, the first that I'm, I'm going in alphabetical order, Michelle Cohen. Uh, Michelle is a member of our Saunders Accounting Advisory Board, um, and um, she is part of the group that put this event together. Um, I'm reading now, so I don't get anything wrong. Michelle is a CPA and an RIT MBA alumnus. Uh, she has also has a bachelor's in math from SUNY Geneseo. Michelle's been running the internal audit department at Monroe Inc. Um, some of you may know them as Monroe Muffler, um, for a chain of 1200 auto repair shops in 32 states, um, has been involved in compliance and process improvements. She works with IT and point of sale software vendors to implement enhancements to the store systems. So if you go in there, you know that Michelle, Michelle's hand is making sure things are working well. Um, Prior to moving into industry, she worked for the CPA firm EFPR, um, in which she was an audit manager and also worked in firm marketing. She is past president and member of the board of directors of the Rochester chapter of the New York State Society of CPAs, which actually is, I think, where I met Michelle about 25 years ago. And Michelle also spent 10 years as a member of the New York State Board for Public Accountancy, the regulatory body in New York State. Um, so, Michelle, thank you for being here. Okay. Um, Next, we have Jeannie Carr. Jeannie is also a CPA, has been with the International Monetary Fund for the last 20 years, and is currently the Division Chief of Administrative Expenditures and Control in the Finance Department at the IMF. Prior to the IMF, Jeannie was an audit manager at PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers in Cleveland, Ohio. She brings extensive experience in financial policies, systems, risk management, internal controls, as well as talent strategy, and has held a range of leadership positions in finance and human resources. Her previous roles include head of the control unit charged with fostering strong operational controls and finance. As project manager, she led financial system implementation and upgrades, as well as spearheaded many implementations of financial policies and products. Jeannie became finance's senior personnel manager, committed to strengthening people management and career development. She later led the IMF's HR strategy, aimed to enhance organizational performance through developing and empowering staff. At the IMF, she's also an advocate for operational resilience, change and innovation, in information security, and diversity and inclusion. And Jeannie is a two-time Saunders graduate, graduate of the MBA and accounting programs here. Um, Jeannie, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. And notice uh, students who are on here, all the different areas that Jeannie and Michelle have gotten into, the different career paths, the different things they're doing. And I'm getting ahead of myself because they're gonna talk about it all. Okay, and last but certainly not least, Chet Watson. Chet's career in both the public and private sectors of accounting spanned almost 40 years. He retired in 2011 after serving as the general auditor for General Motors, when he managed, where he managed the company's worldwide internal audit staff and worked closely with the audit committee of the board of directors. 
Mr. Watson went to GM in 2003 from telecommunications company Lucent Technologies, now Alcatel Lucent, where he served as VP of Corporate Audit and Security. Prior to joining them in 2000, he was an executive officer and VP of Internal Audit at Bell Atlantic, which we now know as Verizon. Additionally, Mr. Watson is a former partner at accounting firms Mitchell and Titus and BDO Seidman and was a senior manager at KPMG. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Mitchell Titus is the largest minority owned firm in the United States, founded, I believe, in Valley Stream. I remember where I was growing up when it was founded. Um, and BDO Seidman is one of the 10, I think, largest firms in the country. Um, he earned his BS in accounting from RIT in 1974. Mr. Watson was elected to the RIT Board of Trustees in 2005. Serves as chairman of the board's audit committee, is also a member of the executive committee, enrollment management committee on trustees, and the enterprise risk management committee. He was inducted into the MCC Alumni Hall of Fame in 2006 and is a member of the board of directors of Manning and Napier Fund, a series of mutual funds managed by Manning, Manning and Napier Incorporated. And he currently resides in White Plains, New York, with his wife, Francine. They have two adult sons, and Chet is really enjoying his retirement. I asked him about that before. And he said he's busier now than he was when he was in industry. Uh, so there's a lesson for everybody. I got to figure out a way to retire so I can be busier. Um, so thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions. We're going to start with a, a very broad question. Um, and, you know, all of you, please feel free to, you know, share um, whatever information you would like to share on this, of course. Um, I'm going to go in reverse alphabetical order, and I'm going to ask Chet to go first. Um, Chet, you've had an amazing career. No question about it. Can you share some of the things you believe launched your career toward this level of success? And whatever that might be, licenses, skills, connections, particular experiences, mentorship, you know, bribes, whatever it was that got you to this level, we'd appreciate you sharing. Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> we all have fun with that. It's unbelievable, this technology. I would rather be there in person, but Bill, thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome to the uh, students and really uh, appreciate the advisory committee uh, putting this together. It's been a while since I've spoken to an RIT group and I always uh, love to speak uh, with and to the students. Um, so excellent question. I, I jotted down a couple of things that I think the students might be interested in. When I attended RIT, I, I transferred from uh, MCC after getting my associate's degree. And uh, one of the reasons I did it was obviously was because uh, one of the reasons uh, was cost. And I um, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I, um, I, I was motivated by a professor that um, many of you know by name, especially the students, and Bill, you may have known him personally, uh, Bill Gasser. Uh, he was really my, my mentor, uh, and he motivated me to pursue accounting. Um, and, and the second person who really helped me was a fellow by the name of Sam Pontarelli. Now, both of these uh, men are now deceased, but Sam was the founder of PKG Equipment, which is a, a pretty, a fairly um, sizable uh, operation in Rochester where they, they fabricate uh, metal tanks and racks for plating, you know, for the plating. And, and the reason I mentioned Sam and the reason that that's uh, uh, important, first of all, I worked as the bookkeeper uh, while attending college, uh, obviously for the, you know, the, you know, the money to help, uh, to help pay for some of the uh, tuition. But when I uh, graduated, I, I got an offer from KPMG, was then called Pete Marwick and Mitchell. And um, Sam actually bought me four suits and a briefcase. He didn't want me to leave PKG, but he said that he couldn't afford me. Uh, he bought me four suits uh, and a briefcase. And so that kind of launched uh, my uh, career because I had the suits and I was, I was, I was raring to go. So, um, the, so, so, so having connections, uh, having a mentor exceedingly important, uh, at least for me in my career. So those two, uh, those two gentlemen really, really helped me a lot. Uh, I, I would say becoming a CPA is important because it gives you a 
professional credentials, but it also gives you the platform. Uh, but, um, communication skills are extremely important for, for everyone, but if you, um, if, if you aspire to, to, to be a leader, then communication skills become critical. Um, I would say that um, having some having broad experience, I think, helps to kind of visualize the big picture for developing uh, strategy. Um, and I would also say that uh, the global economy is so international uh, that, that uh, or the, the global economy is so important that. And the international experience is a, a is a positive. Um, and, and then the the, uh, the final thing I would say is that giving back to society is is exceedingly important. Serving on boards of your favorite cause is a great way to make connections while um, you know while doing something that's very important. I would say that uh, uh, to your question, I would say that those are the things that. Um, that helped to, to launch my career. So, so I have one question for you, one quick follow-up yeah. here. So Sam, Sam bought you four suits and a briefcase. And a briefcase. And so did he know there was a five-day work week? What were you supposed to wear on the fifth day? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you were on your own for that one, right? <laughs> I was on my own for that one. <laughs> you, met, you mentioned Bill Gasser, and so everyone knows there is an annual lecture we do named after right. him. And supported by donations, by gifts from alumni, and quite a few books purchased in his name in the library. So uh, wonderful mentors, wonderful story. Um, thank you, Chet. Um, Jeannie, do you want to share uh, your, a little bit of your, your history and experience with us? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I traveled 10,000 miles, two suitcases, which the only suitcase I could afford when I was a student, uh, across the ocean. and. I uh, landed in RIT. So I have to open say that uh, two reasons landed me at RIT. One was volleyball. Uh, the second one was co-op. Uh, and obviously there's lots of choices uh, to think about in the US uh, system. I didn't quite understand the system then, but uh, then I came over, but I knew that I wanted something hands-on, uh, really practical uh, that I could apply. Uh, and obviously the co-op, I also needed the money. <laughs> No question about that one. Um, but looking back, I actually focused in accounting uh, in undergrad and then pursued uh, international business and finance uh, in that. So I think to start by saying that the basics, um, I think was no substitution for that. And I also may be a bit biased that it's really the foundation of anything business, uh, starting with basically accounting and finance. Um, so I obviously added a little bit of the international element to it. Um, also enjoy some time in the liberal arts college with a minor um, actually in uh, economics. Uh, I looked at uh, developing country economics, which is what connects to my home that time. Um, and finally, fin surprisingly, I also enjoy a lot of my psychology class, which obviously I have to say uh, in terms of the idea of emotional intelligence, even in audits, um, you know, I think that the use of, um, you know, basically where the uh, motivations are, where the incentives are, even on fraud and so forth. So I have to say that it doesn't substitute for the basics. Uh, I ended up moving from New York, Rochester to um, uh, Cleveland of all places, uh, because that time my husband now for many years um, was a engineering senior <laughs> uh, at RIT. Uh, so we met, so he graduated ahead of me. Uh, and so he moved to Cleveland. So I ended up being recruited here in Rochester, but ended up in Cleveland. So I got my CPA actually in Ohio because uh, that was where I practiced. Um, and the funny part is I have to say the one thing that was pleasant, very pleasant to me in the sense of international student was uh, very happy to say, actually that time I had big, I think I was a big five that time. Um, and I applied to four and I had three offers. And I, I think there was something about the practical experience. There was something about RIT as well in terms of preparing, uh, you know, just basic things like resume preparation, interview practice, right? To me, I think there was something about, um, you know, that, that kind of, I felt I had an edge, even though 
I knew, I know I was an international student. So I had to work with visa and things like that. But, uh, and then the more amazing part was um, I stayed back for one year. I received a graduate assistantship from the MBA program. It was just something, no way to pass up <laughs> because it was tuition plus stipend. Uh, so, and, and I finished it in one year. That time the MBA program were still on quarter system. So I, I waived out of four courses and finished my 16 courses in a year because I also was eager to go work. And the three employers, um, uh, I ended up choosing Coopers and Libran, but it was POBC then, uh, waited for me for that year and also gave me a higher starting salary to compensate me for the second degree then. Um, so anyway, to say the one point is just that I think foundation is still something uh, cannot be substituted uh, in a career. And I think what I was very grateful to RIT was that it was a very practical, it was grounded on theories, but it was very practical. And I think I was armed with a lot of IT as well. Just being on campus, uh, very wired. Um, your friends are pretty much every other one, something to do with IT, whether it was computer science next door or uh, it was engineer while well, I was immersed in the engineering community as well uh, with, with my husband then. Um, so to me, no substitute for sort of having that basic and, and the certification as well. Uh, at the IMF, for example, and I know many big fours, uh, you know, IMF uh, for an accountant uh, certification is, is very, very key. Now it could be a CFA, it could be a CPA, it could be a CIA, uh, it could be a, a CISA, it could be, there's many certification now, uh, but it seems that professional recognition is, is still key uh, in the workforce. Uh, two other quick points. Second, experience. Uh, learning is 70% experience. So yes, it's about training, it's about background, but 70% of it, it's, it's really hands-on and just getting out there and trying it out and seeing what it is. Uh, so I had the privilege, uh, before I came to the US, I worked for Intel. I was a statistical process assistant. Uh, I learned about the 286 that time, what they call the cockroaches versus the, the so-called Pentium and others now. And when I interned actually on the co-op in RIT, I worked for a telecommunication company in marketing. And the reason I was so attracted to the public accounting was that my first year as an associate, I was assigned to 13 different industry. Now, this were all very um, uh, attractive to me because I wasn't sure what industry I wanted to land in. And that exposure of getting companies into between manufacturing companies to retail, uh, basically to, I had a lot of governmental client, yellow book audits then, um, and just, um, I had a real estate client, which I lasted for a long time in Cleveland. Um, just amazing exposure of not just the numbers, but what does those industry actually mean? For example, insurance, you have to think about, you know, how does the actual uh, come to play? How is your triangular analysis? You know, you go to retail, your, what you call comm sales because a leap year versus a non-leap year more hard than that, how the comparison of that. Uh, so the practical experience of hands-on beyond the numbers, I mean, the numbers are telling you some story, but it's looking backwards. Finance has a bit more looking forward, but the reality is that when I was on my clients, I talked to the engineers. I talked to the marketers. I talked to the people on the floor. When I was in hotels, um, I talked to the bellhop, right? Now, if they're telling me they're swatting flies and I'm seeing year-to-year uh, -year revenue went up by 20%, I'm going to start asking questions. Uh, so that kind of experience and just uh, blurring even today, right, versus 30 years ago, the blurring of domain. I mean, what is a bank today? A mobile phone company is a bank. Uh, the IMF has a very split personality. We're academic in some way. We are a bank in some way. Uh, we are also a consulting firm in some way for governments. Uh, so it's to say, begin to think about hands-on, but the idea of domain and business and industry, uh, it's all blurring. And that, that makes it, uh, I think, tremendously exciting, uh, even for, for those that are on the call, uh, but but I think more than my time. And the final thing I very much agree with that with, with Chad in the sense that teachers, coaches, mentor. Um, 30 years from RIT, I can still name every one of my 
faculty uh, from that. And I remember the classes that they have, for example, Dr. Gold that time when I did macro and micro with him, you know, his game theory. And I, when I visited RIT recently, I met up with him. I told him, you know what, surprisingly, there's actually real application on game theory. For example, when you design an HR policy on performance evaluation, you want to see how people will game to, to get the higher rating versus another. Uh, and you want to game some of the policies and systems so that you know that you have something that you know will, will give you a fair judgment. So along the way, um, yeah, coaches, teachers, uh, peers are teachers, uh, you know, people you collaborate with. So it's no longer just your boss or kind of the upward, you know, or everyone uh, that you can learn from. And I think uh, those are the three things that I think for me uh, kind of defines uh, and still plenty to go, plenty to learn uh, from, from many, many uh, around me. So, so thank you, Bill. Jeannie, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, St Stephen Gold knows a lot about game theory. He gamed his way into being interim chair of the department while I'm over in hospitality. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Um, so he, he's my boss right now. I was his boss before I went to hospitality. Um, I, I got to say your description of auditing and, and um, you know, 13 different industries and uh, it, it got me wishing I was back. You know, I, I left auditing uh, many years ago and I wish I was back in the field now. Much more fun than being a college professor. Um, and, and I just, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't ignore this. There's a pattern developing here with fives and fours. Um, so you, there were big five at the time and you only applied to four. Chet had four suits, five days. I, I know, I, I saw the student that's, you know, that's casual Friday. Can you, can you share why you wouldn't apply to all five if you're going to look for the big firm? Um, and, and I think of this, you know, I talk to, we have several faculty on here and we talk to students all the time. And my take is always, well, if you're interested in a big firm, apply to all the big firms. If you're interested in industry and in, in government, apply to all the government entities you might want to work for. So would you would you be willing to, to share why that fifth firm you said I'm not going to apply there? It was actually very, I have to say it was an interesting choice. Uh, number one, I applied for the big firm in part because of Visa, because I was looking for the big firms who can sponsor that time the H1B. Uh, and, and obviously one of the attraction versus the private industry of the big, big five then was they paid for it because uh, a lot of their in-house counsel actually has, you know, and, and they move people around the world versus a lot of private industry, actually you would have to hire your own immigration lawyer. So that was number one. Number two, uh, I'm going to say this carefully not to, uh, because many are alums of different one, is I found while they're big four, big five, they have different culture. And I have to confess that I did some research with the culture, talked to faculties, talked to alums of them. And I had to say that I was attracted particularly to Cooper's that time and to some extent to KPMG that time. In part, Cooper's had a very, I would have to say nonprofit culture. Now, they all are there to make you know, a rate. <laughs> There's a rate cut that obviously has margin still built in. But, uh, and that became true because in Cleveland, for example, uh, Coopers, we, you know, worked on the Cleveland uh, account. And in fact, one of our partners actually took a sabbatical to help Cleveland got out of a bankruptcy. Um, I was assigned on a retail client that when Home Depot moved into Cleveland was facing um, bankruptcy. You know, I mean, I don't think many accountants or auditors get to issue going concern opinion, like a real one. We don't <laughs> and want it's, to, it's, right? And it's very, it's very um, obviously difficult conversation with a client and, and it's a very uncomfortable uncom situation uh, to be in, but we stayed with the client. And, and we knew that obviously they could make the rates or the average rates that maybe other clients could do. But Cooper's that time had a tremendous, um, and the reason they let me stay on many clients was, was also because of relationship. And also because that, you know, when you know them, you can help them and they, they can be, the clients can be more open to you. So, so in short, those were the two reasons that number one, why only the big client? And number two, I, I found their culture uh, to be different. And I have to say, I've carried these bias in my current job where when I hire the big four, there are some big fours that I will not entertain. <laughs> so I will be straight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Michelle, your turn. Hello, I can't top that. So I'm gonna keep it very short. <laughs> um, I, three things to me, it's for me anyway, it was credential, um, applied learning, applicability, and getting into an, uh, an applied field and networking. So I really wanted to get the CPA license because I thought it was hard to do. And a lot of people don't have it. And I know that the CPA is, is accounting and accounting is the language of business. I always say that. And I wanted to do something with business and I wanted to be at, so to speak, a higher level. So I went on to get my CPA. That's that portion. Um, applicability, I, when I first went to college, my undergrad was in math and economics. And the math was very theoretical. It wasn't what I thought it was gonna be. I liked numbers, so I took math. And maybe I didn't have the guidance that I needed when I was in high school and choosing what to take. Um, economics, similar, you know, I, it's not really an applied science, so to speak, like accounting is. That's why I went back to get my master's, my MBA, and chose accounting because when you have that language of business, you can go right out and get a job that's specific to, to what you learned in college. So I think that applied learning is important. And I think both accounting and finance have that. And then my third thing is networking. I got in, involved early on with the New York State Society of CPAs very early on. I was still a CPA candidate at the time. And I can just, re I remember my very first meeting and people standing up at the table saying, you gotta give back to your profession. You gotta give back to the community. And I'm thinking, why? You know, I'm just starting my career. I don't get this. And before I knew it, I was doing that and not even realizing that. And I just feel that that networking that you do, what, whatever it is, if, you know, if RIT, go to the events, whether you want to or not sit at a table with adults instead of all students, even though you don't want to. There's been so many things over my career that I've signed up for and it comes time and I'm like, I don't wanna do this, but I make myself do it anyway. And I swear every single time I do that, when I go do something I didn't wanna do, something good has come out of it. Something, I met somebody or or what I, I can't even think right now, but I do feel like that everything, something good comes out every time. So I, I have certain people that have been mentors for me that are accountant. I'm not gonna get into that. I think we should move on to the other questions, but that for, for me are the, the highlights. Wonderful. And I, I wanna put in a real quick plug here. So Michelle and I met probably 25 years ago through the State Society of CPAs <laughs> and uh, the Rochester chapter um, Michelle is still on the board. I am not. Um, the Rochester chapter is very active and a great group of people. So students, um, some of you have heard me say this, but zero membership fee for students. You can join, you can network, you can connect, you can get all the materials and, um, you know, you don't have to put anything in to begin with. Um, and I'm currently still very involved. I'm on the statewide executive committee and it's a great organization. So, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I had to put that plug in though. I couldn't let that opportunity pass. Yeah. Um, so um, we're gonna go to the second question now and uh, let's go in reverse order. So Michelle, I'm gonna stay with you, but okay. then I'm gonna change the order. I'm gonna go from Michelle to Chet to Jeannie. So this way, uh, you know, we mix it up a little bit and uh, you guys know when you're gonna be called on, okay? Um, <laughs> So Michelle, what did you, when you first were an undergrad, when you were first in, in college, what did you think your career path would be? I thought it was going to be something more of along the lines of crunching numbers, actuarial type. And going, at, going into public accounting, first of all, I'm biased. There's two things. When I started my career, to get your CPA license, you had to go into public accounting. It's not the case anymore, but I've had that experience and I've, it was great. I mean, you learn a lot in public accounting and you, I mean, 
they don't really expect you to know anything when you start. <laughs> they want to train you. So um, I've hired a lot of people too. And at Monroe, mainly in industry, I find that folks that don't have that background, um, I don't want to say don't perform as well, but it, 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 it's not as easy for them. It's, it's, it's a lot easier for someone who is in public accounting to grasp all of the tasks that we need them to do. So if you don't know what you want to do, I would strongly encourage public accounting. I really would. Um, and even though you don't need to have it for your CPA or if whether, you're, whether or not you want to be a CPA. But um, I'm doing things that are totally different than I ever thought I would. I, I mean, I, when I was in public accounting, I, they moved me into prof, um, practice management actually when I started having my kids because I was working part-time and I got through all of that for many years working part-time when I was having my babies. Um, but I was writing, I was writing the RFPs, the, the proposed, the bids to get jobs and recruiting and marketing type stuff. I had to make a commercial for my firm. I mean, I never would have thought I would have, would have been doing that. I thought it was going to be crunching numbers the whole time and, and it's not. So thank I'm, you. Yeah. Chat, you want to share where you thought you would be at this point and what career you well, would have gone through? Well, uh, certainly I didn't think that I was going to be an accountant. Um, <laughs> that was just not, <laughs> that was just not in the, in the urban environment dictionary. Um, so I, I did not think that, um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, and there were two things. Uh, I knew I was good at math. Uh, and so I, 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 I actually wanted to be, started out wanting to be an engineer. Uh, and then also I thought about being uh, going to law school. Um, and I, I um, you know, I, you know, I applied and, 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 you know, I actually, I was, I was going to pursue uh, a, a law degree, but decided that, hey, I didn't have the, really have the funds for that. And so I decided I'm going to go to a community college, take a whole bunch of courses uh, and just see what I like, uh, which is, uh, which, which is uh, how I, uh, got on this uh, accounting trip. So I, I took an accounting course. Um, I fell in love with accounting. Uh, and that became my passion. I just kind of loved the no point. I love the benefits of the credit, right? Um, and then uh, with uh, Professor Gasser, he, you know, he, you know, he pushed me along. Um, so when I became passionate about accounting, you know, I, I, uh, I you know, I, I decided to, to pursue it, uh, to pursue it, and it worked out. And I think one of the reasons why it worked out, and, and I would say this about anything, um, in, you know, any profession that you choose, is that uh, if you're uh, if you're passionate about something, uh, you 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 chances are you're going to uh, succeed. You know, my wife has. Um, and she has this on the uh, on, on the refrigerator. I had this on the refrigerator forever, uh, and it's an unknown author. And 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 what it says is that you find your passion. If you're passionate about it, uh, it uh, something, you, you, the chances are you're going to be very very successful. That's my story. I'm going to stick with it. That, that's wonderful. And I, I have, I, I guess I paraphrased that. I must have heard it somewhere along the line about passion, but I always tell students, do something you're going to like, because if you're doing something all day that you don't like, you're going to hate your life. So you've got to pursue a, a career that you're going to enjoy. So that's wonderful advice. Yeah. I built, but can I just add on to one, um, because was, there was a comment made earlier about, about uh, public accounting. I, I just, but wanted to give the students sort of an idea because I, I was both in uh, both in the public sector as well as the private sector, um, and you know just a couple of things because I chose to enter public accounting when I graduated. And one of the reasons that I decided to do that, um, first of all, the the, uh, the travel uh, that was exciting to me. I, I never left the Western New York area. 
so that was exciting. Um, the diversity of, uh, of clients and the exposure to clients, exposure to, to industries. Um, cause let's face it, I didn't know. And as, you know, as a young person, I mean, you don't know what industry, uh, that you're attracted to. So, you know, being exposed to a variety of clients kind of, uh, gives you the pick of the litter. Uh, and, and also public accounting had a very, back then, a very competitive salary. I would say that it paid more than industry. Um, and then uh, the last thing was the swift upward mobility that uh, public accounting offered. Um, I, was, uh, I, was, I was fortunate, KPMG decided uh, that I um, knew a little bit uh, about accounting in the, in the theory. So it decided to transfer me to its executive office. Uh, in New York, where basically it was a think tank. And so, uh, and I did that for about three years, which really, uh, you know, it, it was like going back, going back to college, uh, being able to respond to the SEC and um, responding to complex uh, questions that, you know, the large clients had. Um, on the private side, which I spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, both at, G, uh, at GM, at Lucid Technologies, and at uh, Verizon. Um, there are specialization opportunities, obviously, in, uh, you know, in a big company. Um, there's opportunities to really contribute to the, uh, to the bottom line, particularly if you have uh, a P&L, a profit and loss responsibility. And then there's some, uh, the, the one thing in the industry I found that you didn't have in public accounting, at least when I was in public accounting, was the personal flexibility. Mm. Um, clients came first, and if the client called Christmas Eve, I mean, you had to respond. Um, so I found the industry, uh, you know, there was more personal flexibility. And uh, I would say the other thing is job consistency. Um, the, the uh, and you know, with the, when you're working for a big company, uh, I'll put it the other way. In public accounting, when I was in public accounting, it was up or out. That was that was the culture. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in the private sector, there were additional incentives beyond salary and bonus. And back when I was in uh, industry, it was you know you had stock options, which were very uh, lucrative at the time. And of course, other benefits as well. So I, I would just mention that because I know uh, that sometimes it's difficult trying to make a decision about public versus private, and you know there are trade-offs in each one. But you know, uh, be it public or private, I think you can be successful in uh, in either one. So. Well stated. Thank you. That's wonderful. Jeannie, you want to share where you thought you'd be going your career? Yeah, I, like I said, I was quite, uh, my heart was quite set on being a CPA. Uh, I came all this way. <laughs> I, I, th I thought you wanted to be a professional volleyball player. Wasn't that going to be there? Well, at, at five foot six, I could do well in division three, but not necessarily in the U.S. <laughs> I was, I was very surprised to get that phone call. It was my first American phone call that coach uh, uh, Giuliano and said, hey, are you coming over? Uh, and Nishan just sent me a whole bunch of background. And I said, look, while I played a lot in Malaysia, uh, I wasn't aspiring to play volleyball in America given our average height. Mm. Uh, but he said, Any, anyway, we're a short team. And uh, I came over, walked into the gym over summer and I realized five, six was the shortest on the team. Then I'm, t I'm starting to turn in my head, what is tall? <laughs> 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 anyway, I, I wanted to be a CPA. I, I, I even more fell in love um, about the entire thing about public accounting. And because I was attracted to the values that it was associated with, right? Transparency, uh, trust, right? So there was a whole, a bit of this aspiration or, you know, sort of, you know, I was a young accounting student and just really feeling that my God, with all the, you know, Wall Street wolf and all of that, that you can actually be, you know, stand and, and have principle uh, around transparency and, and integrity and trust. And I just thought that you couldn't find that, right? In the world of, you know, just sort of materialistic and, and wealth and all of that. So I was very attracted uh, to the values 
to some extent that was attached to the uh, attached to the uh, profession. However, I had one particular professor that disagreed with my my own thought, and that was Dr. Judith Schringen, who was my text professor, and she had a bet with me that I would not survive the big four. And her thought of my career that I would somehow end up in a PhD program and end up teaching. And she said the nature of teaching was so much in me. She said, I could not see you uh, being a partner <laughs> in the big five. And, and sure enough, uh, at the time of the five year, I, I did not think she was serious about it. I got a, a Christmas card from her that actually said, have you quit yet? <laughs> are you enrolled in a PhD program? And are you doing this? So the interesting exchange was, no, I haven't quit that time. And no, I'm not going to a PhD program <laughs> because I love practicing too much. I said, however, I am teaching. So I also fell in love and started doing a lot of teaching uh, within the firm. When I was a senior, I would join the, you know, teaching program for the associate. And when I was manager, I would, you know, join the, uh, the firm-wide uh, sort of program uh, for, for, the, for the seniors. And the other incentive was the firm uh, puts us up in the nicest place to coach. So one year I was in Chicago, another year I was in Florida. So I always raised my hand about passing down uh, some of my experiences. And funnily enough, uh, Dr. Schwingen, again, Text is not my thing, as you can see in my profile. I never went close to text, never got an A in her class. That said, I volunteered a lot of work on the VITA program with foreign students about their tax exemption and things like that, and just became really, uh, you know, working with her and, and enjoyed it. And funnily enough, she knew I was a very poor uh, international student. At that time, a financial calculator, I would have to work a lot of extra hours at actually Sandra's at the basement answering phones and doing tutoring. She bought two suitcases for me when I graduated because she thought, okay, you, you're going to move to Cleveland, not show you actually have a suitcase <laughs> to get to Cleveland. She didn't get me any suits. I had to get a salary advance from uh, Cooper's then. Uh, but, but I think, I guess she was right. And I guess I was right. I didn't fully pursue it in a sense of a partnership. Uh, I was on track, uh, had really good careers, um, but I decided at the end, I wanted to do something. Uh, when I went to IMF, I wanted to practice my profession, but connect with an organization to my roots. So I was looking for something international while I can still uh, practice uh, in a way, a lot of accounting and, and beyond. And so I found myself uh, ending up in the IMF after the Asian crisis. I joined the IMF in 2001, uh, which also then connected me to a lot of things that I wanted to do. For example, the IMF had been doing a lot of debt relief. So in 2006, uh, there was a coordinated debt relief to many other low-income countries. And I found myself uh, being able to contribute whenever there's crisis uh, through these uh, lending. Uh, so anyway, I found that I... I I think Chad and Michelle mentioned something about you have to do something that you love and, and really connects to you personally. And, and so the profession and where I ended up to be um, was exactly that. So, so again, knock on wood, call myself lucky. Uh, but again, I was close. I was close to where I thought I wanted to be uh, when I was an undergrad. Yeah, with some modification. Thanks. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, there's always going to be some modification, right? Matter of matter of degree, how extreme it is. Um, thank you. So we're um, the, you know, the time is moving along here uh, too quickly. It usually does, um, and we've got about 15 more minutes. I do want to get one more question in and allow some time for question and answer. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat, and the one more question is going to be a combination of two questions. Um, and, and we'll stick with the same order just for simplicity. You know, I shouldn't be doing this random game show thing and calling on, you know, participants. Um, but we'll stick with Michelle, Chet, and Jeannie. And, and the two combined questions are, did you ever doubt yourself? How did you overcome that? And what would you tell your 20-year-old self if you were, you know, back in college and, you know, figuring out where you're planning to go? So did you ever doubt yourself? 
how did you overcome it? And what would you tell your, your younger self? Michelle, would you like to go first? Uh, ever dealt with I was always worried when I was a young professional about what other people thought. And, but I knew I had, I knew I did a good job because quality was, is my nature. So the way I overcame that was if you're going to put your name on something to do a good job and do a thorough job and as an accountant, um, don't just crunch the numbers and try to get it done fast so that people think that you, you know that you don't associate getting it done quickly with your qualification, being qualified. Getting it done correct the first time is really the most important thing. And step back and take a look at it before you move it on up the chain and just kind of see the forest through the trees to make sure you didn't miss something. Because I think that was my biggest mistake. And I'm, maybe I'm off target on your question, but that was my biggest mistake early on in my career. I would do this thing that I thought I was supposed to do and turn it in. And then you hear, what about this? What about that? Oh, that doesn't make sense. So you learn, you know, after a while, anticipate what that person's gonna ask so that it doesn't come back to you. And they're, and figure out all of those weird things that they could come up with or um, something that just doesn't look right and do it before you turn it in. Um, what would I go back and tell my 20 year old self? I, my, my, my biggest negative has always been public speaking. I would tell my 20 year old self, go, if you're not good at that, that and presentation skills, I mean, a lot of time that, that's what makes the difference. And take a class if you have to. If you have to do Toastmasters, do Toastmasters, <laughs> whatever you need to do. And if you, if you need to present something to your boss, don't give them this big, huge five page you know, book, pare it down in a presentation format because being able to present to management really will get you promoted a lot faster than not and the speaking portion too. Very, very, very important. Um, I'm assuming most people on this call are accounting and finance, I'm assuming that. So everybody thinks it's the numbers and the being good at systems and all of that, but the soft skills are so, so, so important. That's, that was, that's what I would tell my 20 year old self. <laughs> Excellent advice. Thank you. Yeah. Chat. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Michelle, you must have seen my note. Because uh, the first thing that I ever doubt myself, and the answer to the question is obviously yes. And my note says public speaking was a challenge. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> it is. It, it was. <laughs> um, but uh, to your point, and I totally, I totally agree. Uh, uh, there's help uh, for those of you who struggle with with uh, speaking uh, publicly. Um, I actually, uh, I was a member of Toastmasters International, and it really helped uh, quite a bit. But the one thing I've learned uh, through the years is you have to prepare, 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 uh, and know your audience. Learn from, uh, learn from mistakes. Um, there's just one example I'm going to give of where you have to connect with the audience. Um, and Michelle, to your point, or, or you've been a, uh, you're a member of the New York State Society of CPAs. Uh, I've spoken at the, uh, we call it, it's the Career Opportunities in Accounting Profession, where the New York State Society of CPAs, they bring in young people uh, from high school, you know, 15, 15 years old. And that, I don't know, I think it's like a three or four, or four week uh, uh, course at a college, uh, on a college campus where they introduce uh, the accounting uh, 
to, um, to inner city uh, youth who uh, would not otherwise be exposed to the accounting profession. So they asked me to come in to do uh, a speech. And so I'm saying to myself, how do I, <laughs> this old guy, connect with these 14 and 15 year olds? So, um, so one of the things, and, and, and make them excited about accounting. <laughs> so how do you do that? Um, and I, I remember, you know, doing a lot of research. And so uh, the, um, uh, I, I connected with them this way. I says, you know, uh, the rap singers, you know, they've got to, there's got to be words in some of these songs where they mention accounting. I, you know, I want to be cool. Uh, and so um, I came up with this um, in my speech, and and I, and, 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 and it was sort of uh, towards the end where I um, I mentioned uh, notorious B.I.G. and I'm sure the, the the young people in the audience know because you know he has a line in one of his songs uh, that says telephone bill about two G flat, no need to worry, my accountant. So. If the, if the rappers can mention accounting, it's got to be a cool, it's got to be a cool thing. Um, and I also uh, just wanted to mention one other thing too, and this is about following your passion. If you look at um, some of the people who started out as, a, as accountants or they, or, or they have accounting degrees or they, um, uh, they, 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 um, uh, they took accounting classes, you know, you have folks like Mick Jagger who started, who, who started out I mean, he took, he, he actually started out as an accountant, uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, and Gina, you mentioned uh, Home Depot. Uh, Arthur Blank, uh, he, uh, the co-founder of Home Depot, you know, was an accountant. Um, and then John D. John D. Rockefeller. So you mentioned this and, and, you, and you'd see that, you know, people start out in accounting, but then they find their passion uh, in other ways. But accounting was the impetus to get them where they wanted to uh, be. If I could go back, talk to my 20 year old self. There are three things. First of all, I would tell my 20 year old self, when you buy your 500 shares of Apple computer, hold on to it. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would tell my 20 year old self is learn a second language. That's exceedingly important uh, for the younger people on the call. Just, just have have a you know, have a second language, and then there are, lot, there are a lot of studies about you know the brain and and knowing more than one uh, language and 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 the and the 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 intellectual strength that that gives you. Okay, um, and the, the third thing I would say: recharge your batteries occasionally, take vacations, spend quality time with those who are closest to you. It's very important that you do that. Recharge your batteries. So that's what I would tell my 20 year old self. Wonderful. I, I really didn't expect to hear about Notorious B.I.G. and Mick Jagger. So that, that's <laughs> right. Exactly. <awesome>. Exactly. <laughs> and I want to mention also um, for everyone's benefit, Michelle and I were part of the State Society of CPAs group that started a co-op chapter in Rochester in 2003. It runs at RIT now in June, oh, okay. running on, on Zoom now. <laughs> Well, Steve, Steve, who used to work, he was the internal auditor for the for RIT. He's the one who was involved with the co-op program, and he and uh, you know he invited me to be the guest speaker at their uh, graduation. <laughs> Steve may be on here. Steve Morris is a member of our uh, advisory board, the oh, accounting okay. advisory board. So, Steve, I don't know if he's on here, but yes, he, he's been part of the group as well. Okay, so, where where you're going to have the last uh, the last word, and then we're going to have questions. And um, students and, and anyone interested in posting questions in the chat, um, I'll take them from there after, uh, after Jeannie shares her, her, uh, her comments. Um, so I think that Dal, um, obviously the answer is a big yes. And uh, making a decision to leave home country and, and to come here and not sure you're gonna go back and that kind of thing, obviously, there's a lot of question about, is this the right decision? And by the way, the exchange rate of Malaysian ringgit that time to US dollars was, you know, uh, today is four, that time was 2.7, 2.8 to one. So the investment my parents was putting on me was way beyond if I had stayed uh, more local. So obviously there's doubt, but I remember very vividly, there was one particular moment I really had doubt was my inter intermediate accounting course. And that was with Dr. Bud Kurtz. I remember 
obviously accounting, I think most of you would say it's not the most intuitive conceptually, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so I remember having a sort of test uh, that I ended up in a 40, 57 points. I began to ask myself, hmm, is this really my thing? Am I really connecting with these conceptually? I was connected to the values, but I remember going to see Dr. Kearns and said, mm, is this something I can do better? Is this something I'm missing? Is it something that I could learn better or you know, practice more, whatever? He looked at me with a very strange look. He said, Jeannie, this is the third highest score in class. <laughs> significant curve just that at that moment I didn't quite understood it because the highest score was in the 70s uh, so, so it, it kind of got me into place but then I, I obviously came out of that pretty okay after he he made that comment to me uh, st still trying not to get a score on the 50. That said on the overcoming um, so first and foremost I have a lot to thank for my volleyball teammates uh, because my first year playing here in the fall, my teammates actually told me in my excitement of when my adrenaline is running, they cannot understand my English. And that was actually um, something that I obviously, not only that I, I had great command in listening, I had great command in writing, but I wasn't immersed in an English culture. So my pronunciation, my fluidity, uh, was you know something that I could improve a lot. Now here's the good news about being on a team. I travel to play. I was on a bus in between matches, like there was no tomorrow. So I had 11 others best critics and to improve my language skill. Here's my only problem. Was it the New York accent or was it the Pennsylvania accent? <laughs> I had teammates that was trying to buy me over to call a pop or to call a soda and what Scrapple was. Uh, but again, uh, I figured out very quickly that just like volleyball, it's nothing more than practice. Get the techniques, right? There are things that you can control, things that you cannot control, things that I cannot control, I stop worrying. Things that I can control, it's just a matter of getting the right people to help you and just practice and that's it so if you're behind on the certain skills you just practice more often than anybody else just like piano just like any sports uh, just like public speaking probably and uh, and after that you overcome it you can write you just write more often i couldn't do my intermediate accounting i did it more uh, things that i did pretty well like statistics i'd spend less time at it but uh so I realized that the, the scariest thing that probably I did was two suitcases, 10,000 miles. And if I could survive that, I didn't think that there was much that I couldn't survive, um, except for you know, life and death and you know, getting ill and growing old. Uh, nature can overcome that. But other than that, I think everything can be overcome. And just a point of when I was in HR, to understand that no human beings have actually used much of their talent because our brain power usage is very minimal. I understood correctly if it's less than 2%. So when um, one famous thing that I used to do with a lot of people, and I also say that to myself, is that when you get to a point and people say, this is my best, I've tried my best. I always say, I can't accept that. And many of my staff would look at me and say, what do you mean? I said, because none of us knows what our best is. So let's go back, let's try. And I had one particular staff who accidentally told someone that they found writing very hard. So they prefer verbal reports. Uh, that one staff for the next year, even if it had three bullet points, did not get to verbal report to me. The staff had to write a report to me for the entire year. After the year, she came back and said, writing is easy now. So it's, it's a lot of these things are, you can overcome it. And it, there's no magic pill uh, or silver bullet. It's getting the techniques, practice, and there you go. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we are, I think we're at the end of our time, but I think we maybe can squeeze in a question or two. So there was one in the chat, but I'm gonna ask the student to 
turn on his camera and ask the question. Looks like the second one is coming in. Nicholas, would you ask, uh, would you turn on your camera and ask the question that you have? Sure, I was just wondering in today's world, now that more and more people have internships experience, what really makes the difference when you're applying to those big firms or just any job in general? Would it be the public speaking you guys are talking about or you could expand on that a little? I know one thing that's important, first impressions. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off there. Um, the interview, I think the interview is very important. Of course, the resume, because that gets your foot in the door, right? Um, but the first impression for sure. Really important. I think maybe uh, I would jump in absolutely supporting Michelle's point on that is that and again, allow me to be frank and the dose of reality, right? It, I always say between sports and job search, sports are so much easier because in sports, you get a gold medal, a silver medal, and a bronze medal, right? Most of the job search, they only select one candidate. Uh, so the preparation, I think Chad also mentioned earlier is that it's to understand what you're looking for, understand the culture of the firm, do as much research and preparation as you can about the company uh, that you're trying to go uh, and be prepared because you really may have just that shot. And uh, in today's world, I think your world more than 30 years of my time is that basics people have, right? Everybody has a degree or two or three um, and a lot. Also GPA is very strong, lots of extra curriculum, leadership, uh, community work, so sometimes that soft skill and the behavior and the beliefs and you know sort of what your uh, alignment of your value, it's what actually puts you apart from the 100, 200 candidates that is uh, also in that, uh, in that contention. So just offer that, thanks. Yeah, and I just, uh, I, well, you know, I concur, you know, I concur with both uh, uh, Michelle and uh, Jeannie on that. Uh, Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think we um, I think we are past the end of our time. Um, so I'm going to, uh, first of all, thank our speakers, Michelle, Dean, Chat. really appreciate you spending the time and sharing your experience and, um, you know, giving uh, giving the students and giving the whole audience perspective on, uh, you know, different ways to succeed and different things that may get in the way. Um, I also really want to thank our interpreters. Um, really appreciate all the work you're doing. Communication, we said, is so important. And this is a critical element of, of communication. Um, Ken, I will turn it back to our, our host here, our real host, Ken Wu. Okay, thank you. This is Ken again. I thank uh, the speakers in the audience again. Uh, so very quick, our next session will be at the same time on March 31st. And see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good Bye. day, everyone. Bye-bye.